Thank you so much, Hoon and Bonnie, for um, inviting me today. Um, it's been a tremendous honor to be here with this amazing lineup of speakers. And it will be very, very difficult for me to follow me up, Yanis, but um, I'll try. Um, so today I'm going to talk about genome privacy uh, for functional genomics data. And as was mentioned by Hoon in the beginning, right now we have tremendous amount of uh, advances in, in genomics. So in order to make the connections between genomes and the phenotypes, we don't only now collect data from genomes, but we also collect data from personal epigenomes, transcriptomes, proteomes, and metabolomes uh, at the population scale. And this creates issues related to not only the analysis of this data, but also sharing movement and the privacy of the data. So, um, when we share genomics data, such as whole genomics data, whole genomes uh, sequencing data, it's kind of easy to understand what the privacy problems are, right? You can get the SNPs, SVs, all sorts of information about um, an individual's genome. It's not as clear when we have the transcriptomic data where it tells you which genes are expressed or not, and or epigenetic data, which factors binds to DNA or not. It's not that clear what kind of uh, private information we can infer. So then the question becomes how actually we can um, determine if these other types of omics data uh, leaks private information. Um, therefore, the overarching goal of my research has been to address the, this challenge by quantifying the private information leakage in functional genomics data and uh, by infor uh, using that as an in uh, information to protect the private information during sharing and uh, analysis of functional genomics data. And because of time constraints, I will mainly focus on the uh, quantification and then really briefly talk about how we can uh, how we can have some practical solutions to the uh, sharing problem. Um, first, I will uh, talk about what is actually leaking from the functional genomics pipelines. So the, the, I'm going to focus on transcriptomic data for simplicity, but also it's one of the most abundant population level uh, functional genomics data sets out there. And when we um, obtain transcriptomic data, it, we basically sequence the cDNA of the RNAs. Um, and then we get the reads, and then we can further uh, progressively summarize this data by overlapping the reads under certain genomic coordinates and get the signal profiles. And then we can even merge it with other people, other individuals in the data set, and then get uh, samples, uh, sample by genes, uh, gene expression matrices. And then we can even further summarize it by you know, selecting a list of genes that are maybe highly expressed, lowly expressed, or uh, allele specific genes. And together with others in the field, I, uh, we develop uh, ways to quantify the uh, leakage in every step. And then we show that at every step, there's actually private information quantification. And my work today focuses on the first part of this pipeline, what we can get from the reads, and also the very end, uh, if we were to have a list of genes, can we actually learn anything about the individuals? So one of the ways to quantify information leakage is to perform linkage attacks. And we were really inspired by this paper in 2008 when uh, Netflix put out this challenge where they published the um, anonymized user IDs and their mood preferences for some data science challenge. Um, and then the researchers showed that you can actually use IMDB as an auxiliary information to figure out uh, the people's names in this data, uh, data set. And one of the key properties of this linking attack was that the, this anonymized data set was very sparse and noisy. And that was kind of the inspiration for us because if you look at the uh, functional genomics data, it's not meant to genotype the individuals. It was meant to understand some biology. And that's why the genotypes you get are kind of sparse and noisy because genes are only 1% of the genome, for example. And also you don't really get good quality sequencing. So um, how can we do that with RNA-seq data, for example? How can we do, uh, perform these linkage attacks? So let's assume that I have 450 individuals, their RNA-seq reads, and then I also have some kind of phenotype about these individuals. Let's assume that half of them have bipolar disorder and the other half is control. So, and then I have a person of interest, let's say my friend Jane, and I somehow stole Jane's genome. And now what I wanna know if whether Jane is in this data set, and if so, what is her bipolar disorder status? So what I can do is I can genotype the reads from the RNA-seq and I get this really noisy data set. Uh, you can see the precision and sensitivity is pretty low. If you do very vanilla uh, genotyping, uh, you don't get really much. 
and I already have the genome of Jane, and then I can actually intersect Jane's genome with every single individual in this data set, and then score this intersection based on the allele frequency of these genotypes. And then I can rank these genotype um, linking scores, and then uh, based on the ranking, I can assume that the top rank individual is probably Jane. And to be able to have the statistical significance, I can then uh, further um, develop a metric called gap that tells me the difference between the top rank individual and the rest of the cohort. And if this gap is statistically significant uh, compared to randomly generated gaps, then I know that Jane is the 10th individual and therefore her uh, bipolar disorder status is uh, positive. We did this for all 450 individuals, and we show that it's 100% accurate. We further downsampled these reads to see where it breaks. We also added a lot of false positive genotypes to the RNA-seq data. And as you can see that even at very low um, uh, sampling rates with high amount of false positive genotypes, we can still re-identify these individuals and link them to a phenotype. But this is kind of easy, right? I have Jane's genome. So it's not really, uh, with the current protections in place, it's not that easy to get someone's genome. So what if I make my job a lot harder and um, collect coffee cups from individuals? Um, so we, we found two individuals, six coffee cups from each, and then um, extracted the DNA, sequenced them, and then tried to connect them to the RNA-seq data set. And now we played with the sequencing depth and we increase the genotyping by imputing the uh, genotypes, so forth. But as you can see that in most of the cases, even at very low coverage, 0.125x when we do on the coffee cups, and then very low coverage of um, RNA-seq read sampling rate, we were still able to uh, link these individuals with almost 100% accuracy to, the, uh, to their phenotypes. And this was about $19 worth of sequencing, uh, including the reagents, so it was pretty easy. So then we thought, okay, how about we make it even harder? So what if I don't have RNA secrets? They are blocked behind uh, control axis. I only have a list of genes that are um, allele specific. I know that they are more expressed in one allele compared to the other allele. And I have a phenotype linked to that. Can I actually figure out who this individual is? Um, so what I need is actually to collect a set of SNPs by using allele specific uh, expression. And what I know from biology is that in order to phase the RNA-seq reads, you have to have a heterozygous SNP somewhere in the gene or around the gene. So what I can do is I can, for every gene, I can look at the exons of this gene and I look at heterozygous SNPs uh, based on their genotyping frequency in some population panel and then collect these SNPs and say that, okay, these are the list of SNPs that belongs to this individual and their genotype is heterozygous. Can I use that to link this individual to a database? When I did that, basically, um, we found that around out of uh, 380 individuals, 55% of them were, uh, we were able to link them by just having, you know, 15 to 20 uh, number of genes, nothing else, no genotypes, just the genes. And then we, we thought, okay, there are some genes that we know that is allele specific in every individual, like HLA or imprinted genes. If we can remove them, we can further increase this re-identification attack to 70% accuracy. So this was pretty surprising to us too. So linking attacks are great. You get a lot of information about what kind of leakage there is in the data, but it's really long, right? You have to computationally really cumbersome. So we decided that maybe we can create tools that will um, assess the risk of re-identification um, very fast. So for that, we developed a supervised Gaussian process learning model that takes the sequencing uh, properties of the uh, functional genomics data and then outputs how many variants you would expect from the data. It's pretty accurate. And then later, my uh, colleague Prashant also developed this uh, hidden Markov model based model where with 10 to 20 common SNPs, he can tell a variety of uh, risk measurements about uh, these individuals. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of leakage in different types of functional genomics data at uh, different levels. Uh, even a list of 10 to 15 genes can be really identifying. But then the question becomes, how can we actually share this data? Because we really want to share this data. So we came up with this data sanitization technique. And the idea is that we want to sanitize the variants, including the SVs and SNPs, in a way that it doesn't hurt the utility of the uh, data. So we were inspired again by existing uh, 
computer science uh, literature where uh, we created a sanitizer that kind of balances the privacy and the utility. And this is very similar to the question of when you have a bunch of images, you don't want to, for example, reveal the gender of the individuals in the, those images, but you, can, you still want to be able to run, for example, machine learning on them to learn something else. So we developed this technique called privacy preserving tra transformation to the BAM files of the RNA-seq data and then created these PBAM files that are uh, balanced between the uh, privacy and utility. And we can do this by simply defining what is privacy and what is utility mathematically and then show that there is actually a balance between the privacy and the utility par parameter. And we can actually numerically calculate the bounds of privacy and utility loss. And we can show that empirically that as you increase your privacy levels, as you can see, GAP tells us if I can re-identify this individual, it becomes really low. And then this blue curve tells me how much error I added to the data. And then there is the sweet spot where you see that there is, uh, you cannot re-identify the individuals, but you only add very small amount of error. And this can be actually mathematically optimized by using uh, the numerical bounds. And now we can even show that empirically, if you were to calculate gene expression from a BAM versus a PBAM, the difference between those two quantifications are within the biological noise because they are actually smaller than the difference you would get from the replicas, biological replicas of the two samples. So data sensitization is really great. It works with all sorts of functional genomics data, but it is a practical solution. It works today, it may not work tomorrow. There is no mathematical guarantees. Um, and also, you cannot do this data sensitization with uh, genetic variants because uh, whole genome sequencing data because we want the genetic variants. So then the question becomes, is the privacy of DNA sequencing data hopeless? I'm not going to answer this question. Um, there are technical uh, solutions that uh, my lab works on homomorphic encryption, for example, but I think David and uh, William will tell you a story, tell you two stories uh, that how we can leverage the existing cryptography um, literature to, to do that. With this, I really would like to thank my postdoc advisor. Majority of this work was done when I was still in his lab and also my uh, former lab uh, mates, Charlotte Prashan and Arif, without whom I would not be able to do any of this. And um, many thanks to Andrew Maranker who gave me a bench in his wet lab so that I can um, steal people's coffee cups, I guess. Um, and many thanks to Mike Cherry that they, they made a really nice software package for people to use the data sensitization. And I'm really thankful for my um, funders. But most importantly, I'm really, really thankful to my new limited lab. Um, these very smart individuals took a chance on a new PI. And they've been working on uh, functional genomics privacy. So keep your eyes peeled for more work from, from my lab. And also, I really want to thank um, the small genome privacy community that we have here. Um, as a young scientist, I, many of the senior members in this panel, including Bonnie, Lucila, Brett, and Yanif, they've been very helpful and supportive. So if you're a young scientist, uh, this is the place to be. Thank you.